Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony Payan. I'm the director of the Center for the United States in Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you this morning to this forum to discuss one of the major initiatives of the Lopez Obrador administration in Mexico, a counter reform designed to partially turn back the clock on Mexico's energy reform that, that now dates back to 2013, 2014. This counter reform focuses on the electricity sector, where Mr. Lopez Obrador wishes to recentralize production, distribution, and all management of Mexico's electricity sector back into the hands of the parastatal utility, the Federal Electricity Commission, or CFE. As you will see from our wonderful panelists today, there are many reasons for us to meet here today. Uh, monopolizing the energy sector in the hands of the state is a failed model of the past. It is designed to kill competition, introducing distortions in the market. It is not good for consumers as they will become once again captive to a single provider and unable to exercise choice. And it is not good for Mexico's ability to provide energy that its development requires as the government is, in my view, unable to invest the kind of capital that is required for the production and distribution networks. Uh, this is a capital in, in invest, uh, capital uh, uh, intensive uh, energy sector. And of course, it requires the kind of capital that the Mexican government may simply not have at hand. To discuss the many dynamics of this reform, as I mentioned, we have a stellar panel today. They will be introduced in a minute by Francisco Monaldi. So let me tell you about Francisco, a colleague of mine and friend here at the Baker Institute. Francisco Monaldi is the Baker Institute's fellow for Latin American energy and director of the Latin America energy program at the Center for Energy Studies. Francisco is also of course, affiliated with the Center for the United States and Mexico. He's also uh, a lecturer of energy economics at Rice University. Uh, Francisco Monaldi has a long record of uh, studying the energy sector uh, in Latin America. He has a PhD in political economy from Stanford University and an MA in international development economics from Yale University. So let me welcome Francisco who will tell us who the panel members are this morning and then he will lead the conversation after that. Francisco, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Tony. It, it is a pleasure uh, being with uh, all of you today. Uh, we have a, a, a great panel, as Tony said. He already gave um, a, an introduction, so I will be uh, just very brief saying that we, we, we have uh, three experts that uh, with whom we want to discuss uh, what are the motivations behind this uh, energy reform, what has been happening in Congress where it has been uh, being discussed, and, and what are the likely, what is the likelihood that, that this reform might pass, what can investors, what will be the reaction by investors, by the United States, by the Mexican uh, uh, private sector, what could be the consequences. So we, we have a, a, a great panel, um, uh, uh, please uh, turn your cameras on. We have uh, Mariana Campo, who is the coordinator of the Public Expenditure Accountability Program of Mexico, uh, Mexico Evalúa. We have uh, Professor Guillermo Garcia Sanchez, um, who is an associate professor of law at Texas A&M University School of Law. And we have Miriam Gronstein, uh, which you uh, have seen in our programs in the past because she's our non-resident uh, scholar for the Center uh, for the United States and, and Mexico at the, at the Baker Institute. All of them, uh, I mean, Miriam, of course, uh, 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 one of the most uh, um, important consultants in the energy sector in, in, in Mexico. Uh, and um, uh, Mariana uh, uh, and Guillermo have been working on, on these issues uh, that are very relevant for the Mexican economy and, of course, also uh, for the United States, given the, uh, that, that these two countries are so, so tied together. So let me start uh, with uh, Miriam, uh, that I know has been following uh, the state of play of what, what's been happening in, in Congress, et cetera. And tell us a little bit, what are the key elements of the reform that we should you know, have in mind and how this has been evolving in the discussions in, in, in the Congress, in the Mexican Congress? Go ahead, Miriam. Well, the formal discussion in the Mexican Congress hasn't begun. What we have is an open parliamentary discussion with members of civil society and members of government. 
Mariana Campos uh, delivered a brilliant 10 minute presentation in the parliament. So I, I take the chance to congratulate her. Um, this has been a long process. It's, it'll be about a month and a half since the parliamentary discussions began and we'll see the, what the negotiations, how the negotiations actually involve. So I'm gonna have to give a really, really fast summary of what the, of the contents of the constitutional reform. But let it be known that this is a constitutional reform. Um, Lopez Obrador had presented before um, a legal reform and, uh, and, an, and an administrative um, act that, that gravely affected the, um, the, the electricity sector. Now, in my view, this constitutional reform affects the energy sector at large. Uh, people generally call it uh, electricity reform. I call it an energy reform because it does impact the hydrocarbon sector as well. Since number one, um, let, let me talk briefly about the contents of the reform and about the saline contents. We have Femex and CFE becoming um, not government tool, not NOCs anymore, not nationally owned companies, but um, government and agencies instead, um, which is pretty worrisome because of the financing structure, the debt structure, the accountability, the transparency regime, all, all of that could change. Um, drastically, and also as Mariana may, may, may comment later, they would have to be funded by, 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 by means of the national budget. So Petróleos Mexicanos and Comisión Federal de Electricidad, the oil company and the utility company could become um, government agencies as such, which is, and with, and with, with constitutional autonomy, which means that they would be detached from the public administration, from the federal government. So that is a cause for concern. The second element, well, well, the second element, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm organizing this in terms of what comes to mind, not in terms of importance, because everything is, is really important, actually. The disappearance of the regulatory agencies, meaning CRE and CNH would be incorporated into the, the Department of Energy, which also um, lessens or destructs or nullifies the autonomy and, and independence of this agency. At this point in time, this really doesn't make any difference because they're, they're actually captured by the Secretary of Energy. But in the long run, if you wanna have a market, you want to have regulatory agencies. And the third part that I see that is very, very concerning for private investment is the reduction of the market for the private sector to 46% of participation and CFE would have a 54% percent in power generation. There's been some confusion where the, where the, whether this um, includes um, consumption or not, but let's let's make it clear. It would be 54 per generation for CFE. And this would mean canceling permits and contracts. And that would be highly via, that, that would be a high breach of, of existing rights for private companies. And also, aside from this being a big breach, this would entail um, a threat to energy security in Mexico. This meaning, uh, at this point, CFE does not have the installed capacity to generate 56% of national power production. And I would leave the elements of the reform at that because I could go on and on forever and um, it wouldn't suffice. Thank you, Miriam. A, a great, uh, great summary of, of the main elements of, of the reform. So let me uh, move uh, on to, to Mariana and, and ask her uh, what are, is her, her view of sort of what are the motivations behind the energy reform and what do we really need to understand uh, about uh, this reform? Go ahead, Mariana. Thank you, Francisco. Hi to everyone. And thank you for this uh, great space to, to talk about this important reform. First of all, I would like to say that um, I am a, an expert in public finance, so I know the sector uh, from this perspective, and I, and I have participated in, in many reforms and discussion in Mexico. So this is like my view. The view I have is from my experience. And I believe this reform was not written down by the federal government. It was written down by um, the state company. Um, the Federal Commission of Electricity. And I, and I think that this company wants to regain power. 
so there's power reasons for this company because the the state company experienced losses with the reform of 2014. Remember that the past reform put the regulation for developing a market for the generation of electricity in Mexico. So the present reform is a counter reform against that market. Uh, the reform established price mechanisms such as auctions. Um, you know, that reduced the, the Federal Commission's power and control to assign contracts. Um, so it doesn't surprise me that this reform is proposing to have a constitutional exception to make tenders when assigning contracts to private contractors. You know, so I think there is a motivation. I don't know if this is corruption or not. I don't have that detail, but I believe there is a will to regain power. Um, also, the market is rewarding cost efficient providers and see uh, and the federal commission, the state company is not efficient. The state company operates with all plants to generate electricity, carbon, gas and uses fuel oil. According to the superior audit institution from Mexico, the state company plants have an average of 42 years old and almost 40% of the plants have exceeded their useful life. It generates electricity at the double of the private cost. So, uh, so they, they have been great losers with the new market structures. Um, today, the, the private sector generates um, on average 62% of the electricity in Mexico. It's very important to note that the state company and the federal government have not been investing enough to update the technology to increase efficiency. Per capita public investment in electric infrastructure has dropped dramatically since 30 years ago. It was not enough 30 years ago, and they used to invest uh, 700 pesos per capita. Now they do invest 300 per capita. So it's completely uh, insufficient, you know, and there is a big lag in the technology that the Commission uses. There are also financial reasons behind this uh, these reform. The state company's balance in 2021 with and without government transfers was the worst in the last 30 years. We saw something very bad because usually the operating balance uh, used to be negative since many years ago. But with the federal transfers to help and support this company from with resources from the public uh, budget, the financial balance used to be positive, but they couldn't achieve that in 2021. And this is really with no precedent in history because the government turned its back to the commission, to the federal commission. It abandoned the commission during 2021. 2020 was a very, very bad year, financially speaking, but 2021 was worst. And, you know, with the, 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 the gas uh, problem in Texas, that raised the, the costs of the, of the state company. And Hacienda, you know, the treasury turned its back and say, I'm going to give you the money that we budget, we have in the budget. I'm not going to give you any more pesos. So they abandoned. This has never happened before. And I think that the federal government has picked its favorite state company and it's not the Federal Commission of Electricity, it is Pemex. While the federal government gave to Pemex $15 billion to help the company, they gave uh, just one third of this amount to the federal commission. And so, so the, situ the financial situation of the company is really a problem. During 2020, they reestablished the retirement plans they used to have before the reform of 2014. Those plans are so ambitious, no Mexican has access to those plans, to those retirement plans. And they are not really in the reality, the financial reality of the company. And uh, so they reestablished those plans and also that put a lot of pressure in the finances of the company since two, 2020. Just two, two, um, two years before that, the company used to have a uh, profit, two years of profit. That was awesome for a non-profitable company, but they lost the profit when they reinstalled those um, ambitious retirement plans. So, so 
I think that they are not efficient, they have financial problems, and this government turns, leave them, left them with the financial problem, and the support has been very little. So I think that in the past um, administration, the treasury used to give enough money to the company to, you know, make her be more, uh, to come more to terms with the reform of 2014, but that support is gone. So I think that is also part of the motivation of this um, reform. And I think that it's very important that the private sector in Mexico and all the people that we want this reform not to, to be approved, we have to think on a solution for the Federal Commission of Electricity. And the solution is not only to just make this reform not happen. We have to think how this commission can regain a space in the market. How can this commission be profitable? And because the motivation is going to be there all the time. So even though this reform is not going to pass, the force and the motivation from them against the market is going to stay. So I think uh, it's very important to negotiate, understand their means. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana. That's a very interesting and, and important point to understand that why the CFE wants this more, uh, uh, not only because of you know ideological uh, motivations that, that uh, Mr. Barlett or uh, President López Obrador might, might have about uh, you know centering the, the the power of the state-owned enterprises, but but also this uh, 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 very real situation in terms of their uh, um, their income and their uh, financial situation. Uh, by the way, you you also mentioned that uh, Pemex is of course the the darling of the president and gets uh, all the help, and this uh, will also help uh, Pemex to sell their uh, uh, refined products uh, uh, to produce uh, electricity. So there is a side, a side <laughs> benefit for, for the preferred uh, company. So let me move uh, to, uh, to Guillermo now. Uh, Guillermo, of course, uh, uh, has been uh, following and is an, an expert on uh, the uh, USMCA and the uh, and, uh, energy uh, uh, law in terms of uh, you know, uh, international between countries. And so, Guillermo, we, uh, a, lo a lot of people might have thought that the, the fact that Mexico had first NAFTA and then the USMCA might make it relatively hard for, um, a, for a change in the sort of the, the rights of investors, of foreign investors in this uh, uh, space. So uh, will the USMCA have uh, any uh, role in, in uh, limiting the, the path of this reform or in, or in its implementation? What can you tell us about the role of, uh, of uh, this very important treaty? Absolutely, Francisco, and thank you for, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, Mariana and Miriam. Uh, so the, as you just mentioned, the USMCA for some folks is like the boogeyman that is going to come and stop the reform. And for other folks, the USMCA is like the Cid Campeador, right? It's like, it's just sent out there, but it actually has no bites uh, in order to stop Mexico. So one of the things that I'm going to try to do here in my initial presentation is to talk about the elements of the energy reform that have an impact on the USMCA and also how the USMCA tends to regulate the energy market. So when you hear, uh, if, you, if you were paying attention to the uh, uh, forums that happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, some of the government lawyers came along and said, there is no energy chapter in the USMCA, hence we can do whatever we want in the energy sector. And that is true in the sense that there is no energy chapter in the USMCA. There used to be one and it was taken off during the negotiation process. This was a big change from NAFTA because NAFTA did contain an energy chapter, even though Mexico explicitly reserved that sector uh, for its state-owned company. So what was left in the, in the USMCA? The Mexican government keeps saying that they were able to include uh, uh, chapter eight, which is the chapter what is called on the sovereign right of Mexico to develop its hydrocarbon resources. And that is a check on allowing the Mexican president to change everything in the energy sector. So just by reading the title, you already figured out that that chapter only touches the hydrocarbon sector. It doesn't touch on the energy sector. So power generation doesn't, is not covered by, the, by chapter eight. But also when you deep, uh, read deeply into what chapter actually eight does, it is really what I call a placebo clause because it's not saying anything else that they already customary international law and other treaties have already recognized 
which is that states in general have the right to develop their natural resources in any way that they see fit according to their own constitutions. And this has been recognized by the United Nations General Assembly resolution on the permanent sovereignty of natural resources of 1962, the uh, uh, chapter on socioeconomic rights, and even some conventions like the United Nations Conventions of the Laws of the Sea when it comes to uh, resources contained in the continental platform. So it's really not saying anything. Of course, every state has a right to uh, regulate its own natural resources and extract them the way they see fit. But what is interesting also about chapter eight is that it does mention that Mexico has that right as long as it doesn't affect the rights contained in the treaty. And this basically says both the rights of the United States government, the government of Canada, and also of the investors, particularly in the hydrocarbons and the electricity sector from the United States. So Mexico, in a way, did not reserve, even though the Mexican government wants to say that that's a reservation, the chapter is a reservation of the energy sector, Mexico did not reserve the energy sector to chapter, through chapter eight. And also, it, in a way, it didn't reserve the hydrocarbon sectors because it's not giving a monopoly uh, of the sector only to the state-owned companies. It's just saying that Mexico can develop them the way they see fit. When you look at the general reserv uh, uh, reservations and exceptions of the, of, the, of the agreement of the USMCA, and you go to chapter uh, 32, Mexico does make reference to other treaties there, um, Mexico's that actually has signed. And particularly, it is important to notice that in the CPTPP, Mexico established as the base ground for the energy sector, the rules passed in the energy reform of 2013. So Mexico pledged in the reservations of the USMCA that they were not going to take any more restrictive measures than the ones adopted in other treaties, henceforth, all the reservation, all the, all the uh, uh, energy reform was included in the USMCA through the reference of the res general reservations of chapter 32. Now, and here it's, 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 there's an also an interesting reservation there, which is the general essential security reservations. So the treaty in a way cannot be interpreted as preventing the government from taking measures that affect their essential securities. And that is why uh, uh, when, when, when Miriam was describing the reform, and actually when you look at the text of the counter reform that was presented, the Mexican government actually mentions national security. They are saying that in order to guarantee national security and the right to a dignified life, the state will ensure energy self-sufficiency and the continuous supply of energy. That's what they are saying. That's why they're trying to justify the reform under a national security exception. So maybe the Mexican government is going to try to justify it through the general exceptions of chapter 32 when it comes to energy. The challenge there is that an investment tribunal or a state-to-state -state panel is going to analyze what other measures were available to the government to achieve the same result without enacting restrictive measures that affect the USMCA. And here is where Mariana's description of the state of, of CFE comes into play, because it's going to be very hard to justify uh, for the Mexican government to say that to achieve energy self-sufficiency and energy security, the only way to do that is to give a monopoly and a constitutional autonomous position to CFE because of the reasons that Marianne explained. CFE is not in a position to achieve that goal, right? They don't have the capital, they don't have the, te the technical elements, they don't have the capacity to achieve it. So in order actually to achieve self-sufficiency, you need to diversify your electricity matrix. So that is, you know, that's gonna be a very hard uh, uh, argument to try to, um, to, to overcome. Now, there are other chapters on the USMCA, such as chapter 11, that talks about technical barriers to trade. And again, that chapter states that the state cannot take more restrictive measures that become unnecessary obstacles to the trade and investment relationship. And again, the test there is, are there other measures to achieve the same goals that Mexico is trying to achieve? And they're going to have a hard time justifying. Now, uh, chapter two also talks about, for example, national treatment and market access for goods. So Mexico's import and export restrictions for hydrocarbons, which is something that they're trying to achieve uh, for all the products, cannot be discriminatory and, and cannot be, uh, and it has to be in a transparent way. This was not in the NAFTA 94, actually in 1994, Mexico reserved the right to block all export permits for arbitrary measures. It was no, there was no standard. Now Mexico has to actually do it in a non-discriminatory way. So this whole idea, we're going to protect the gasoline produced by, by Pemex to, and avoid any, any import permits from, from outside, that is going to be a challenge uh, that might be breached chapter two. So now also chapter 22, when it comes to monopolies, here's another important chapter. So Mexico in that chapter establishes that it ensured that all regulatory agencies, this includes the current ones like CREA, CNH, and, uh, and ASEA, and all of the ones that were passing any reform, cannot discriminate against private companies for the benefit of state-owned ones. 
only they can only enact regulations for commercial considerations. So here is the challenge. As Mir explained, CFE now becomes market player, regulator, and an autonomous organ of the state, right? With constitutional autonomy. So it's going to be very hard for, the, for, for, for Mexico to prove that whatever action CFE takes in the market, just to give you an example, CFE is saying, well, the private parties can still participate because we are going to actually renegotiate contracts where we can purchase the electricity produced by them. How are they going to do that in a non-discriminatory way and a non-market way if they're also players on, in the market, right? What sort of rules are they going to put there for those bidding rounds that are not discriminatory to the private parties? So that is, again, Chapter 22 is going to be a big, big challenge for the Mexican uh, uh, agency. And then chapter uh, 24, we talks about the environmental standards. And in that particular chapter, Mexico pledged to pass legislation and to implement its own, its own environmental commitments. And this would include in the case of Mexico, the Paris uh, Agreement, where Mexico pledged to reduce its carbon emissions. In that chapter in particular, Mexico also created a system where individuals can bring claims uh, 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 to a particular uh, bodies uh, uh, between Mexico and the United States in order for those claims to be reviewed that could eventually end up to a state-to-state -state company. And finally, the most important one that I, we're going to have more time to talk about is Chapter 14 that talks directly about investor protections. But I'm going to leave that for the next round uh, so that people actually stay tuned because this is the one that is going to trigger a lot of interest as we go down the line. <laughs> Excellent, uh, Guillermo. Well, fascinating. Uh summary of all the implications of USMCA uh, for this reform and for the uh, energy uh, sector and hydrocarbon uh, sector. Uh, so both uh, uh, Miriam, Mariana, and, 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 and you uh, have uh, mentioned this has uh, seems to have uh, uh, implications uh, further than the electricity sector. So, uh, you know, it should be considered an energy reform because it's affecting uh, the other uh, parts of the energy sector, like uh, oil and gas, for example. And even some uh, potential, I mean, mining, it's uh, explicitly mentioned in terms of uh, uh, critical uh, minerals like lithium. Um, so, Miriam, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you think, how, how do you think this will affect uh, other sectors uh, broader than the uh, electricity uh, sector? And, 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 you know, I, I think uh, um, the, the potential, of course, uh, it's not only that it affects these other parts of the energy sector and the mining sector, but of course, uh, the industries in, in, in Mexico that rely on, on themselves on these uh, uh, different parts of the energy sector uh, will be affected. And it could also affect uh, the competitiveness of, of Mexico uh, and the capacity of, for example, do uh, the near shoring of bringing, you know, industries that could have been, you know, in China, but could become, uh, you know, could move to Mexico because of the advantages of USMCA and being close to. So there, there are plenty of potential uh, uh, effects. Uh, what, what, what is your take on this? Well, in the, in the, in the last two, couple of weeks, we have seen some really interesting phenomena. For example, in the past 10 days, three big consortia of an EMP, that had um, contractual areas in deep water have either assigned their rights or have returned their rights to the state. And I don't think this is a coincidence. For example, Total with, in consortia with Exxon, they, they, they returned their area to the state. BP, I think, assigned it to Luke Oil, to a Russian company, which is, um, which is very interesting given the geopolitical <laughs> moment we're living. And also some other another company, I can't recall the exact name, but three contractual areas were either assigned or returned to the state. And my feeling that this is going on is that the threat of actually having the, the, the disappearance of the regulatory agencies is very threatening to them. The, the, the more reliable regulatory authority has been CNH. And if the administration of the contracts goes into CENER, into the, into the Department of Energy, instead of remaining in um, CNH, this is very threatening for multi-billion dollar investments. So we're seeing, the, we're seeing this contraction even in oil and gas, in EMP, which seems unimaginable, but it's actually happening. And I don't think it is actually a, a mere coincidence that this reform is actually being about to be discussed formally in Congress. Also, in fact, it affects the self-use um, generation plants 
which generate for several companies. So the, the whole supply chain is going to suffer because if these generators lose their permits and their contracts, they're going to purchase, have to purchase energy from, from CFE. So even, some, so even something as basic as white bread might become expensive because Bimbo, the Mexican manufacturer, the biggest manufacturing of, of white bread has a self-use generation plants. So the whole supply chain will be affected by this reform. Um, also, let it be known that, that a lot of these generators use um, pipelines that use privately owned pipelines. So what's going to happen with, uh, with, with the contracts that, that actually are concerning that whose object is, in a, is, is, is transporting natural gas if the generation um, permits and contracts are canceled? You see, there would be um, who, who, would, who would they deliver gas to in case these generation plants um, stop? And also, let's be realistic. Even if they do cancel a big portion of these permits and contracts, see if he cannot just jump in because he cannot do so legally. We would have an enormous power outage. It would be disastrous. So, and there's no transitory um, a, a strategy for a CFE to jump in when the when, when these permits and and contracts are canceled. And also, there is no explicit strategy for these so, so for these contracts and and permits to be canceled. There is no transitory um, regime. There is no actual reason. So I think litigation, domestic litigation is going to explode. Maybe not much, not as much commercial arbitration. I think investment arbitration is hard, is, as, as Guillermo mentioned, is far from, from occurring. And as opposed to Mariana, whose uh, presentation I thought was completely brilliant, and, and, and I'm so sorry I cannot comment with her her, her remarks more because we are we're, we are we are a shortage of, of time. I believe this reform will pass, and I am terrified. I've been looking at the weakness of the opposition. The pre declared that electricity should become a human right. It, uh, about three days ago when they were in the, in, in the discussions of parliament and my blood just froze. I cannot believe that the party that actually launched the most ambitious energy reform to be to ever be happening in Mexico calls electricity a human right. And I don't have anything against that, I, I, against that statement in itself. It's just that it might connote that electricity should be free for all and who's going to supply the budget for that and i want mariana if she can at some point to comment on that because if electricity becomes a human right somebody has to pay for that human right and we don't even help we don't have we don't have money for health we don't have money for housing we don't have money for education and suddenly electricity becomes a human right so who the heck is going to pay for it so I am very concerned that the whole Mexican economy is going to be financing, the whole public finance is going to be financing energy when the whole supply chain is going to be affected. So this is a very concerning moment. And I do believe that big chunks of the reform are going to be approved because they want to give something to Morena in case Morena wins the next elections. And let it be known that popular, for support, popular support for this reform, according to some polls, is still popular. Why? Uh, and, the, and the answer is very, very, very interesting. There was this woman and the day before last saying, well, CFE gives me bad service. Give, the CF, because of CFE, I have power outages. Because of CFE, I have half high, uh, high rates to pay. But I'm hoping that with this reform, I'll have free electricity. And she was in the parliament. And she represents, I think, a big chunk of what the hell, of how the Mexican population feels. And we should pay heed to that. And one last remark, deriving from Mariana's statements, and I cannot resist. 
Our big failure as market supporters has been to only look for ways in by which we can actually have private investment improve the service. As market supporters, we should look for ways by which CFE can participate healthily in the market. And we have not done that. And we're looking at the repercussions because as Mariana said, CFE suffered as a result of the 2013 average reform because we were careless. So we, we have to be very, very careful with looking for ways in which, what, in which we can revive CFE because as Mexicans, we have to look at, some, uh, at one important thing, public investment, I mean, private investment will leave if, 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 if the shots are unbearable. And we're going to be left with CFE. So we better take care of it in a strategic and healthy way. Well, with those <laughs> very concerning and comments, um, uh, uh, that we will have, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, some time at the end to, to, to go further on your point of if, uh, if it's going to be approved or not. And I, I will uh, ask uh, each one of you to, to sort of uh, give us uh, a little bit of uh, the reasoning uh, uh, on that issue. But I, I want to, uh, by the way, I, I'm very happy to see that we already have some uh, questions coming in the Q&A. Um, uh, we will leave some time for, for answering those questions uh, in, in, in a moment. Uh, so please, if you are, uh, if you want to uh, write uh, some questions, uh, please do so. And our panelists will uh, be able to, to, to read them and I will ask them uh, some of these questions. Um, so let me move to, to Mariana. So Mariana, we uh, uh, all the, the discussion on the concerns that you already and Miriam and, and Guillermo have uh, manifested. Uh, uh, bear the question: Is this uh, uh, reform? Is it feasible to implement it uh, as it is? And 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 what uh, you know uh, will be the the obstacles to making this uh, this work? Could it, uh, could this actually work the way it is designed? Well. I think that definitely is not feasible to uh, get it implemented. Of course, it can be approved. And I definitely think like Miriam, I mean, this can happen. And I, I've been in many reforms. And right now, the, the people, the legislators that are defending the reform and the ones that are opposing the reform believe it's not going to pass, at least not in the terms that it's placed. However, anything can happen because reforms, you know, depend on if uh, legislators get political pressure, economical pressure, anything can change any day. So promises cannot keep up until we are not in April 30. We cannot assume it's not going to be passed. So, um, so that's why I think that we need to think a lot into the CFE motivation and work on a solution on that urgently. But um, why I think it's not feasible? Well, I was just telling you that the financial situation of CFE is, is, is in very bad shape. And this comes because the federal government just is not helping CFE as before. And, um, and this is happening because also the financial situation of the government is in a very bad shape. I mean, 2020 was horrible in many countries, uh, but we haven't uh, recovered as other countries. And remember that 2019 for Mexico was a year of negative economic growth. And many nations, even Latin America, had a good growth. So what happened in the first uh, half of this administration is that public income has been suffering a lot. The government just finished and consumed all the stability funds and the uh, savings of many, many years in funds. So, uh, so the government and, 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 and the Mexican government is a very bad tax collector. It collects 16% of the GDP, but the average in Latin America is 23%. We are a very bad collector, even in Latin America. We are 30% at least behind Brazil 
and these nations that you know are peers of Mexico. So we have like a chronically poor government. That's that's a reality. And the economic situation we're facing, I mean, we thought that economic recovery was going to be much better at the end of 2021. At the mid uh, mid 2021 mid year, we thought the G the GDP was going to grow 8% and we just grow, grew 5%. The economy was, you know, really sluggish at the fourth uh, trimester of last year. So, so the government has no money to invest in uh, in this electricity company. The company has no money. So, uh, who's going to pay for the investment is needed to substitute the, fine, the the private investment? Nobody. Actually, this reform was presented without a financial plan. That surprises me. Like what kind, I mean, a serious reform should be presented with a financial plan. And, you know, the federal responsibility law in Mexico, Article 18, says that the federal government has to put a financial plan, you know, uh, to, to, to in, a, in, in every initiative. And they didn't accomplish that. I mean, they don't care about the law. They didn't do a financial plan because actually the government has a no compromise financially speaking, with this reform. So what is going to happen in practice is that they just want to regain power in the market. They want to control the contracts. They want to, you know, do not comply with the market practices. We don't want to be an enterprise. We don't have, we don't want to have an obligation to be profitable. And what is going to happen in the practice is that private investors are going to participate under discretional terms. That's what I see. So we're going to have an increase in uh, in the price of electricity. We are going to have a decrease in the quality of service. And this is going to hamper, um, first of all, the government, because, you know, investment is going to run out more than what we have seen now, because we have seen a lot of investment leaving Mexico. But what is going to happen is that, remember, public finance live on tax collection and tax collection is a function of economic performance. So investment is going to go out and maybe sooner than implementing this reform, we're going to get into a deep economic crisis or a fiscal crisis. That is going to happen. I'm going to let you, I'm going to tell you that in 2020, there is some, I mean, like $10 billion um, dollars that the government do not explain where they came from. So I don't know if data is actually real in the public finance. I think that the public finance problem is deeper than what we see on the official numbers. And I think that this reform, if it gets passed, maybe we're going to go into an economic crisis, a fiscal crisis before the implementation. So the so that's one scenario. The other scenario is that if we don't go into an economic crisis, we're going to get high prices of electricity, low investment, and of course, a terrible service. Okay, so those are my, my views. Thank you, Marianne. I'm I, I'm I'm uh, more worried uh, than I uh, I started, uh, which uh, which I, I was pretty worried al already. Uh, I I, um, I think it's very important what you both, uh, Miriam, you and, and Mariana, have uh, expressed the, the the concern about uh, uh, implementing a reform without knowing how much it's going to cost. And uh, and and this, uh, uh, I, you know, I've seen it uh, elsewhere in Latin America. This idea that you, uh, I mean, constitutions are um, uh, having this. Uh, view in latin america that you put something in the constitution and therefore it, it you know it, it, it sort of happens you know it's a sort of uh, let's put the right of uh, energy for everybody in the constitution you know if you see the constitutional convention in chile today uh, that's you know uh, uh, what they want to do put uh, all rights uh, uh, there and of course rights cost money and uh, as you both have pointed out um, uh, you know it's it's not clear that even today uh, the cfe and the and the Mexican government is capable 
uh, uh, of, of financing these these needs and and the growth that Mexico uh, will have economically and the needs for energy. So um, it, it is pretty concerning uh, that uh, you know that this is not clear and th this might have these effects uh, uh, in the in the implementation. Uh, let, let me move now to, to Guillermo uh, and and continue sort of uh, uh, discussing the issue of investors. What legal avenues do they have internationally or domestically uh, to challenge in in some way or another uh, uh, this uh, uh, this reform and their effects over their um, their specific uh, uh, investment or contracts. Talking about costs and adding to the costs of the reform. <laughs> so, for us, just a very quick comment on on the right. Uh, you know, we legal scholars always say there is no right without a remedy, and then you can add the, 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 the addition: there is no remedy without a budget behind it. So, if you cannot pay for the remedy then there is no really a right. And that's a big challenge. And I think, uh, 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 you know, both Mariana and I Miriam mean, just explained it very, very neatly. So what are available uh, uh, to the investors? I'm going to focus here on the international avenue. There are still some questions of whether they can, there's a possibility of trying to bring a constitutional claim. It's going to be very difficult, especially if it passes as a constitutional amendment, especially try to connect it to other human rights, especially the access to the environment. So there might be a chance there that a constitutional block kind of a human rights for us, uh, 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 for the environment might help out, but I'm not gonna focus on that. I'm just gonna leave it on there for another forum. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, what, it, what is left for the investors in particular is chapter 14 of the USMCA that I started to describe earlier today. So what is uh, uh, chapter 14 basically sets up a set of rights and standards of behavior of the government when it comes to interacting with foreign investors. That is what chapter 14 is. It, it really takes over what, what used to be chapter 11 on NAFTA. There are other in bilateral investment treaties out there for those investors that are not from the USMCA region. I wanna also leave that hanging. If you're from Spain, you are from uh, Japan, there are other treaties that Mexico has signed to pledge. But in particular, the USMCA, what they did is they carved out specifically protections for the energy sector in Mexico. And that is very important to, to, to mention because for other sectors, the USMCA really uh, 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 downward the, the amount of, of claims, that could, the type of claims that could be brought by, for, by investors. So they limited only for certain rights such as national treatment, the direct expropriation and most favored nation clause. But during the negotiation, they said, no, actually, this, the energy sector, specifically power production, hydrocarbons, licenses, and contracts, they are so important that we have to give more rights to those investors that are not, that are not only limited to direct expropriation, most favored nation clause, and national treatment. And so they added, for the particular energy sector, also the, the right to be treated fairly, equitably, and the right to uh, and indirect expropriation. As a, as a claim against the government. And what is direct expropriation? This is the most important one, I think, uh, that we need to be very clear. Direct expropriation is basically sort of regulatory takings, right? I make up rules and regulations and taxation and taxes that make it almost impossible for you to operate in a way that you are actually getting any profit, right? I'm working for you, right? <laughs> I'm basically not getting what I'm supposed to be getting out of it. Now, the USMCA does specify that any regulation that has an economic impact, the fact that it has an economic impact is not enough to allege an indirect expropriation. What the USMCA does clarify as well is that Mexico, right? if Mexico did a specific commitments with the investors and those are investment backed expectations, then indirect expropriation must follow. So canceling licenses, canceling permits, canceling contracts, all those kinds of things are reasonably well investment backed expectations. So if you cancel them out of ordinary, uh, discriminatory and arbitrary way, that immediately has an impact uh, on the Mexican government. Now, what would the Mexican government could argue? Well, also the USMCA specifies that the, the government has a right to regulate for specific welfare objectives such as health, environment, and safety. And the USMCA shouldn't be interpreted as preventing the government from regulating on those sectors. But here's the trick. It can only be do, done in a non-discriminatory way and in a non-arbitrary way. And I think, again, when we analyze everything that we discussed in this forum, it's going to be a you know, steep climb for the Mexican government to prove that they're not trying to benefit just one actor that is inefficient, that cannot actually achieve the goals. So all of those elements are going to be analyzed by the tribunal. 
Now here, you know, they're always mentioning the Spanish cases and what happened in Spain and it all came up. The Spanish cases are, are, are important uh, uh, to, for this analysis because in Spain, some of the tribunals face similar situations. Now, a note, the Spanish legislation was much, much, much less in terms of what, what impacted the sector, right? It only involved uh, questions about fixed tariffs and uh, fiscal incentives. It wasn't the, what we're seeing right now of a dis, dis, disappearing uh, autonomous regulatory agencies and those kind of things. But in that case, you know, some of the tribunals ended up finding that Spain, the fact that they had passed a framework for investment was a reason to believe that there was indirect expropriation because investors expected the framework to remain. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been investing in Mexico and in Spain. And that is the big question that investors, uh, the, the tribunals asked. If the investors uh, hadn't received these kind of uh, reassurances, would they have gone there or not? And most probably they wouldn't have in, in the case of Mexico. Now, going to the remedies, the money. Here is what I believe sometimes uh, uh, we get confused about the power of these tribunals. One of the biggest challenges is that specifically in the USMCA, investment tribunals do not have the power to leave without effect constitutional changes and legislation, right? So that's when the Sid Campeador analogy comes along. I think that the opposition has overstated the power of the USMCA to prevent the reform from passing. This is not true. The tribunals will never be able to order the Mexican government to leave without effect the legislation. That is actually specifically established in the treaty. What they can order is compensation, right? And they can order compensation that amounts to multi-billion dollar claims. Now, the challenge here, Francisco, and you know it very well with the Venezuelan case, is that many of these litigations take many years. I've been, I've been mapping down the, 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 the cases in Latin America. And what I found is that the average investment case in Latin America uh, takes between four and five years, but in the energy sector, it goes all the way to nine to 10 years, right? So you're talking about 10 years to litigate one of these cases. And ultimately that's the, the data that I have is only until the day of the award comes out. There's still another process to enforcing that award. And then there is another process for the government to issue the check. Right? And if you look at the, down in the history, sometimes governments, they end up saying, well, we'll give, we'll give you in pagos pequeños a largo plazo, no small payments in the long run, because I can't pay a multi-billion dollar, or I'll give you another fund. And think about it, 10 years. In 10 years, how Mexico is going to look like? It's probably going to be another uh, government in power, right? assuming that we don't, we don't pass uh, any amendments to uh, uh, keep the same president for more than one term. Uh, but there's going to be someone else in power, and somebody else will have to pay the bill. And I think the government in Mexico knows this. They know that if they litigate these and they drag the litigation, it's going to take around 10 years. And that also explains why in the energy sector, you see always a third of the cases end up being settled throughout the proceedings because investors give up. Investors, unfortunately, they put down the sunken cost. There's you know, huge issues involving in the amount of investment they put down. And they know they're going to spend 10 years litigating them. And who knows who's going to pay and how long it's going to take them to get that money back. So many investors end up giving up and renegotiating the contracts. And that is a fact that you know, I think the government knows it. Then they're, they're negotiating arm's length uh, 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 with them because they know ultimately the investments are already there. And that's why the, 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 the data that Miriam provided is so illustrative. right? Those that haven't investment, invested that much, they're still in a position, position to say, here, take it back. I don't want to, I don't want to stay here. I'm not going to risk it. So what we're going to be seeing is investors that were starting to invest further, especially in the, in the ENP sector that haven't reached the development stage, they're going to start giving back those fields because they don't want to stay there and risk being uh, uh, directly expropriated or treated unfairly, right? That is always a possibility. The ones that stay because they put the sunken cost, they're not going to reinvest the way they have to, right? And you see this, you know very well, uh, Francisco, what happened in Venezuela. In Venezuela, 38 of the contracts were signed in, in the 1990s, only two ended up in litigation. But the 36 that stayed, they didn't invest with the same eagerness, right? And that's why all the fields ended up being depleted and they are not doing any tertiary recovery, they're just leaving the assets and uh, abandoning the state, right? You want the investors to know that if they stay, they can keep reinvesting, they can bring new technology, they can make the, the things, their, their, their uh, sunken so cost more efficient. And I don't think that the ones that stay in Mexico are going to do that if they decide to stay. That's a, a great point, Guillermo. And as you know, it's a, an issue that I, I, I'm really interested in. Uh, and we have uh, talked about this in, in the past. And I think it, this is pretty concerning for the future of Mexico. Because Mexico ha had become one of the countries in the region that that was perceived as uh, reliable in, in this uh, uh, you know in this area, and and for the future of the energy sector uh, as we move into electrification, 
Uh, you know, this is particularly uh, relevant because, as you point out, a, a regulatory uh, the, the investments in, in energy in general are very susceptible to expropriatory uh, regulatory expropriation or indirect expropriation. Um, you know, by just, for example, not allowing you say there is inflation and you know the, the, you cannot uh, set the, the, it's not a competitive uh, tariff or um, uh, you know there are so many ways in which you could be um, uh, affected and these are some of these think about uh, someone investing in solar panels you know this is a, a, a sunk cost you make all this investment and then the maintenance uh, it's it's much less and so you are susceptible to you know really really bad regulatory expropriation. But of course, as you point out, if if you cannot defend from that, and, and if the country becomes uh, 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 perceived as having a high risk of that, what would happen is that investment will be limited in the in the future. A, a government can can maybe you know very effectively expropriate, but then the consequences are paid by the country in the in the long term. So I think this is this is pretty concerning, particularly in the energy transition. And uh, uh, further, uh, I mean, later I, I, I want to talk a little bit about also the implications for this for for climate change policy and for you know emissions in in Mexico, etc. Uh, but let me let me go back to to Miriam and, and please this round let's be brief because we have a, we want to get to some of the questions of the uh, Miriam. Do you think that the Mexican government is going to be uh, in breach of its own constitution if this reform is passed as, as it's uh, presented uh, today, given all the things that we have talked about? I think it will, because CFE cannot possibly cover 50%, 54% of the generation. I mean, it, 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 it's really, it is a really interesting point that um, to find that the government will violate, that the, that the proponents of this reform will eventually violate its, their own constitution. Number one, see if you cannot take over um, 50, 54% of the power generation. And, and less so with the imagined, because I, I, I won't call it planned. I would call it imagined dispatch order being hydros being the first um, power generators to be dispatched. I mean, Mexico has a very grave water source shortage problem to, be, to begin with. And these power generators are, 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 are far from, from the main centers of, of, of power consumption. So that's completely unrealistic. Then come the, 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 the other um, power generators or CFE, then the, the, the IPPs, independent power generators, then the, the the generators coming from the from the from the auctions, and then all the other generators. I mean that dispatch order is completely unrealistic. And number two, if Pemex and CRE, I mean Pemex and CFE become agencies, what's going to happen with the contracts that were executed with their suppliers, with their service providers? I mean that's going to be just hell to pay because they're going to go into a, a completely um, different financial and economic regime. So the risk of the government violating its own rules is humongous. So they, they should be very, very careful looking at what they can comply with and what they cannot. And also, if they commit to canceling and um, the contracts and the permits and then they don't comply, they're going to be breaching their own rules. Because the, the whole reform is so illogical that the, 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 the possibility of the government breaching its own rules is immense. Because if they comply with the reform, they're going to be breaching the contracts and the financials of the, uh, of the, that, are, that are feasible within the government. And that, may be, and that may just be a complete train wreck. So they should, and, and I don't think anybody's discussing it because they see it as feasibility, but not as a, an actual legal breach. And the government is liable for breaching its own norms. Now, I would like to make a brief comment on what Guillermo said, which is brilliant, because people think that, 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 uh, that their, the investment arbitration and commercial arbitration are just instant or very, um, um, reachable disparate resolutions 
um, mechanisms that are that are available for private investment. I spoke to an executive of a power, um, a renewable power generation company yesterday, and he said no way they want to go to a commercial arbitration because they would be looking at a at a horizon of ten to twenty to, to fifteen years. Then the ruling of the of the panel has to go to a Mexican judge who's going to be under a lot of pressure, and then you might have to execute assets outside the outside the country because the assets cannot be executed within Mexico because they're public assets they're nationally owned assets so we have two planes of of, of breach the breach to its, to its own rules and the breach to agreements with third parties and that would be a complete train wreck in terms of the rule of law in Mexico now we'll leave it at that because I know we're short in time Thank you, Miriam. Uh, Mariana, uh, um, I, I wanted to, to go a little bit further on what you think uh, will be the effects of the, um, of the, of the reform it's actually implemented. And maybe we can weave some of the questions that David Ocañas has uh, uh, asked in the, uh, uh, you know, that uh, he, he's been asking specifics about, you know, what will be, uh, if it will be the CFE, the only seller of electricity or, uh, you know, other uh, could generate their own electricity and, and uh, other questions. If, if you can, if you can, uh, you know, include some of those uh, um, in your answer. Uh, otherwise, we can we can do it, deal with it uh, later. Go ahead, Maria. Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that um, this reform was uh, designed or or thought about um, definitely before what we're living right now. I mean, it's so like. It's such a bad luck for the people that want this reform to be implemented, that we are in such a bad economic shape. And I think it was never thought about it when they when they thought about this reform. So I think this reform and because of the, 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 the things that Guillermo and Miriam are, are saying, this will hamper investment so badly that maybe things are going to come faster than we think. And this is going to put us in a very delicate economic situation. I mean, just um, some months ago, um, analysts were thinking that Mexican economy was going to grow four, three percent this year. Right now, the expectations is between one, one and a half, two percent this year. So, so, so I think that. Um, the things for the government are getting very, very tough right now. And the first thing is going to happen is that the Mexican government is going to lose the investment grade if they approve this reform. And that is going to increase the financial cost of the government. And public finance are really in a very bad situation. So, so this is, I mean, what, what is really unbelievable and so irrational from the government is to push for this reform when the government is going to be the first agent, economic agent, that is going to be very damaged. So um, it's going to increase um, the cost of financing. It's going to just, the tax collection is going to be so, so damaged that the risk of a financial crisis is really uh, of a fiscal crisis is real then i think it will um foster a lot of corruption let's say that we survive a fiscal crisis and this reform gets implemented there is no public investment for this reform so private in um providers are going to still participate are going to be participating, of course, in the generation of, of electricity, but they are going to suffer the corruption, you know, the old ways of doing uh, business with the government. Tenders that are going to be, you know, pre-assigned, no real competition at all. Cost efficiency is not going to be at all a criteria to assign the contracts, and there's going to be a lot of corruption, and not only for the providers. The consumers, we are going to face a lot of corruption because you're going to be in a line. Hey, I need I need utility services. Oh, but you have to pay me more money to, you know, have a contract with the Federal Commission um, uh, enterprise. So so uh, we're going to be suffering long lines, corruption, blackouts, really bad service. Mexico is not going to be competitive because this is going to hamper 
the whole economy. So what we are right now facing is a real threat to Mexico's economic development. And this is huge. It's going to go much, much further than just the electricity sector. This is going to hamper Mexico and the economy. And also the cost of opportunity of all the money that is going to go from the public uh, budget to this end is going to damage other sectors, education, health, infrastructure that is not related to energy. You know, Mexico has always suffered that opportunity cost. When you used to see right now, public investment is very, very low. You know, it's 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 we have few public investment. But in the past, when we used to have higher uh, amounts of public investment, half of it goes to the energy sector. And so we are a country that we have been suffering that cost of opportunity. So for me, this reform, well, we have to work a lot with the vision of the Federal Commission of Electricity. They don't see what I see and what many of us see. I think there's great things coming for the electricity sector. We are going through many transitions that will foster demand for electricity exponentially. And they don't see that. They, if you hear them in the open parliament, they are discussing all the time. We have a lot of uh, capacity that we're not using. We're overbuilding capacity in Mexico. I don't agree with that. We're going into electromobility. We're going into an hydric crisis that is going to demand a lot of, a lot of electricity. All the financial sector, it's increasing its demand for electricity. So come on, guys, look to the future. There is coming a piece of cake for everyone. You have to prepare yourself in legitimate. And, and, and you know, if you need capital, you have to go into the stock market. You have to be profitable and you have to be efficient. And I don't know why they can go out to the to, to the private um, stock market. So, well, um, those are the risks I see. And hopefully we get to discuss solutions with the legislators. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, this is, I think, very useful. And, and I, I think uh, you're right that this is uh, very concerning because not only because of the needs of the future in general of economic growth of Mexico and the advantages that Mexico could have, uh, given that, for example, it has the, the, the access to the, the gas from the United States and, and it has so much potential in renewables, for example, in, in, in solar and, and wind, etc. And, and the opportunity cost of, of not developing all that would all the effects that it could have in economic growth uh, and uh, and in the uh, in the viability of fiscal viability of the government and the like. I think these these are very important concerns. Sometimes in the U.S., people think about this reform more uh, from the perspective of oh, they are breaching the rights of our, our investors or maybe some add the, the the potential consequences in terms of climate policy. You know, John Kerry was down there emphasizing those but for the united states and we are you know we are a us uh, based institution the concern should be also that if this uh, weakens mexico's competitiveness and growth this will have impact of course in the region as a whole because of uh, you know poverty issues and and migration issues and other issues that will affect the united states in the long term so i think uh, the, the us should be really concerned about this and, and with that, I, I want to ask Guillermo, and, and also weaving uh, one of the questions that Matilde uh, Sada uh, had, which is sort of, uh, um, besides the diplomatic engagement, we have seen the ambassador Salazar being used by the government as sort of uh, uh, giving a, a support to the reform in some way. But then we, we saw the, 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 the Secretary of Energy of the U.S. and, the, and Secretary and, uh, and Bo, uh, Special Envoy uh, John Kerry go down there and, and express their, their concern. So what besides that can the U.S. government do uh, with, uh, with respect to the reform? And uh, is there any role for the state uh, to state uh, panels of the uh, USMCA? And, and in particular, going to Matilde's question, um, is, is it the issue of environment? The issue of GAG emissions increase because of the energy reform. Is this an issue that could be used uh, uh, with the, within the USMCA to challenge uh, uh, the reform? Guillermo. Thank you, Francisco. I think you touched uh, uh, on two very important issues. So why would the US, you know, whoever is listening in, in the webinar, why would the US care what is happening in Mexico? The key component is here is that if the United States wants to be competitive, 
against China and other regions, they need Mexico. And they need Mexico to be also efficient in their supply lines. If suddenly the light bulbs go off in the big factories in Mexico, micro components are not gonna get into the US factories. So we are integrated in many supply chains. The risk of that happening is very high with the energy reform. And that is why John Kerry and the US government has been trying, going down and trying to pressure and say, what is happening, right? This is gonna have a great impact on the competitiveness of the region. So that is really what the, that's a boogeyman, right? That is the effect of how is this gonna impact the competitiveness of the United States to compete with China and other regions. And it is a real threat, right? That's beyond the climate change threats and what is happening. So that's one thing. The other thing that is gonna happen is that many companies we already know have pledged to reduce their carbon emissions throughout their production chains. So GM, many companies say, we are not gonna consume or we're not gonna reinvest in countries where we cannot access clean energy. So many companies have already threatened to leave Mexico if Mexico continues down this line because the energy reform, the way it's structured, cannot guarantee that the production of energy in Mexico is gonna keep becoming more cleaner and with rest, less carbon emissions. So for all the reasons we discussed, the use of combustolio and fuel oil and all the and inefficiencies of the CFE. So that's the other big boogeyman. Companies are not gonna have an invest, interest to come and invest here, especially right now, some of them have the, the capacity to do self-production, right? And that's one of the things that are gonna be getting, they're trying to get rid of in, in, in the reform. You can no longer produce your own energy and you can no longer buy from private actors. You will have to go through CFE. So that is no, there is no incentive there to come out. The third boogeyman is really the state-to-state -state panel. So even though I criticize the investment uh, dispute resolution mechanism, the state-to-state -state has a little bit more teeth because when you do a state-to-state -state panel, when one of the parties breaches the USMCA and many of the uh, chapters that I talked in my first intervention touched, uh, give this possibility, the other country can put countermeasures. So they could raise tariffs in, the, in sectors that can be proportional to the effects that are happening on their sectors. So that could be a possibility. The United States feels threatened. They could actually bring a claim to a state, state tribunal and raise tariffs and make it harder for the Mexican economy. Now, that would be terrible for Mexico, considering what Mariana just explained to us, right? But then that could have an immediate impact. You don't have to wait 10 years for the countermeasures to take place, right? So those could be imposed in the shorter run. The chapter regarding chapter 20, 24, I'm, I'm so glad they, they brought it up because that's a chapter where the US actually could bring also. First, a consultation mechanism and a, a, a state-to-state -state, uh, mediation panel, and then eventually a state-to-state -state dispute mechanism uh, if Mexico decides not to enforce its own environmental laws. That is how it's set up. Mexico has to enforce its own environmental laws. And under Mexican legislation, international treaties have a hierarchy above federal law. So this would include the Acuerdo de Escazús, the Escazús Accord, they will include the Paris Climate Change Agreement, and if Mexico, through bypassing the energy reform, decides not to comply with those regulations, there is a chance, first, that individuals can bring a claim in domestic courts in, in Mexico, and that could eventually reach to a state-to-state -state mediation panel and uh, through the Commission on Environment, and then eventually a state-to-state -state, uh, dispute panel. So that is a possibility that, uh, uh, that is available on the USMCA. Great. Well, we, we will have to close, uh, and, and, um, but I, I want to give you a sort of a, a last set of, a, of a brief questions and, and any of you who want to who wanna take them. Um, Miriam mentioned that she's concerned that it might be approved. So the first question that, that if, if any of you want to say something very brief, even a percentage likelihood, you know, do you think this is going to be approval, uh, approved? And if so, how watered down, how different from the current proposal. So I know that it's hard to be brief with that. The second one is if it's not approved at all, if there is no energy reform, what would happen in terms of the legislation and other ways in which the government might want to implement it anyways? We know that the courts have stopped some from that happening, but you know what, what tools the government has. And finally, some, someone is asking about the, the future. Uh, uh, we, for example, the, the mayor of, of Mexico City that seems to be a, a person that cares more about, you know, environmental issues, et cetera, has supported the reform because, of course, she, she might be the candidate of uh, President uh, López Obrador, although we don't know uh, in the end. Uh, but sort of what you see as the future of, uh, 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 you know, if, if it's not approved, 
in terms of Mexico, is this uh, 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 is there appetite in the in the political body of Mexico for this kind of uh, is this the way we're going to go uh, even if it's not approved or or uh, you know what what is the political equilibrium there? And so I, I will start. Uh, please be very brief, uh, Miriam, and then Mariana and Guillermo, uh, and we and we close. Uh, go ahead, Miriam. Thank you. Uh, the the mic. This is what I think will certainly be approved: the live the nationalization of lithium, because that's the there is there's great uncertainty as to what the what actual reserves of lithium are in Mexico. So it's 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 not an immediate loss for private investments, and also concessions for exploitation of lithium are going to be um, honored. The actual just but what what concerns is the other strategic minerals what do they mean by strategic minerals that might also might be nationalized so i think that the nationalization of lithium as a as a as a piece of candy for the president will be will be approved and um and there's many political elements too that i cannot explain at this point um that that is that that will happen to keep the president happy um, I think that um, the, the, the self-generation plants are going to be um, transformed into generators, which um, I, I cannot mention because we, because we, we don't have, we, we don't have a, enough time, but um, that's going to be a complex process because if you, if you actually terminate the, the self-generation permit, you're in a legal void. So what is your period of grace to become a, a regular generator to actually enter into a, 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 a bilateral contract with a consumer? But I think that's a reality. Self-generators are going to become generators. We all have hazards that may go in the way. I think that CFE is going to reserve <coughs> an exclusive percentage of their generation, which might not be 54, but might be 48, but might be 47, who knows? It's a political number, I cannot tell. I think the, 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 the regulatory bodies are going to survive, but as part of the ministries, as part of the, the departments, and I very much doubt that PEMEX and CFE will become government agencies. But of course, my crystal ball might be broken or not. You never know what politicians have in their brains. So that would be my my forecast. Great. I think we we lost Mariana for a second. So uh, Guillermo, can you comment on any any of this? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, so it's it's la la land. But I can tell you at least that I think in terms of litigation, many companies are going to wait to see what happens with the new presidential elections. Right? They're going to pay to see, uh, because one of the things that can happen, we all talked about constitutional amendments and how those affect in Latin America. But then how you enforce them, how you implement them matters. And who is in power at that point matters. So many companies are going to wait and see whether it's going to be Marcelo Ebrard or it's going to be Lauda Sheinbaum and whether there's going to be an open opportunity there to renegotiate some of the integrated elements. I think something has to pass for sure. Uh, specifically, I think that the, the energy regulatory agencies that are going to probably be integrated into the into uh, CENER or, or CRE, that's for sure. Because Francisco, one of the crazy things, I'm just gonna be very, very brief about this, is that they truly believe that the fact that you create state autonomous agencies equals to taking away regulatory power from the state. That's a big misconception, big, big misconception. You're, you didn't, they didn't privatize the sector, right? And they, but they are selling it as we gotta get control back. The state needs to regain control. CNH, CRE are state organs. The state is always been there. It has never disappeared. But in their view, autonomous agencies really take regulatory power away from the political entities. And these are particularly the Ministry of Energy. So they want to regain that control. And so something is going to happen in that end uh, for sure. I don't know. Uh, the contratos, the, uh, um, the self production contracts, I think, as Miriam said, uh, 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 Director Barlett has a personal fight against them. And so those are definitely going to have to be migrated. We don't know the terms, but I think if that, uh, if that if there's one thing that it's a no, no, uh, no change for the government is the disappearance of those contracts. Great, uh, thank you very much, Guillermo. As you mentioned, you know sometimes there is uh, this confusion between government discretion and and the state uh, actually uh, being able to take a, a sort of a longer term view of uh, of policy uh, of the implementation of, of policy. Unfortunately. 
sometimes governments what they want is pure discretion, which of course brings about uh, also a higher political risk in, in some uh, dimensions. And of course, there is always a balance between a, a, what, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in democracies, what uh, uh, elected politicians can do and, and, and what uh, the state tries to uh, tie their hands in terms of, uh, of doing uh, uh, with uh, just the discretion of the, of the current executive. So thank you very much. This has been a, a great uh, panel. I really have enjoyed uh, moderating it. Uh, the, the three of you uh, have uh, uh, given very, very interesting uh, angles on, on this uh, uh, reform. And of course, this, this is a discussion that will continue because uh, we haven't seen the, the end. And uh, so probably we will uh, uh, have you uh, uh, again in the future to discuss this uh, issue. So thank you very much to uh, all uh, that have joined us and, and to Miriam, Mariana, and Guillermo. Goodbye.